Thank you, Serene and Abigail. And I'd also like to thank the NCATS AGM in providing me this opportunity to share some basic rules of thumb for basic statistics and data analysis that will ensure robust high throughput assays. Now these rules of thumbs have served me well during my career in drug discovery and lead identification in both the pharmaceutical industry and in academic drug discovery sciences. They also keep you from having to learn all the gory statistics, but just some simple rules of thumb and guidances. But before we talk about that, in the next slide, there are just some basic considerations for assays that will be used uh, for both high throughput screening as well as, you know, lead optimization, even before one considers statistics. The assays that are employed should be rigorously validated for, first most, biological and pharmacologic relevance that, you know, it's that the assay actually reflects meaningful disease biology. That the reagents are stable and that they're, they're stable during the assay as well as during storage whether and during the process of aliquoting and whether they're stable to freeze thawing and what how stable they are at different temperatures. And more importantly whether stability is different in dilute solution working solutions as opposed to concentrated stock solutions and whether these working solutions are stable you know during the period of the assay operation uh, on the bench top whether it's on ice or at room temperature. The assay should be evaluated for robustness and performance and to improve that one has to be aware of and eliminate systematic errors. For instance, you want to look at the MSO compatibility and tolerance and check that when you run a plate that it's relatively uniform in terms of the data you expect, uh, that there are no edge effects, whether there's no end drift or striping, which I'll show you examples of in later slides. And that the interplate and interday uh, performance of these plates uh, look consistent, that they're the same in terms of their max and min, signal to background, and their standard deviations and variances. And if you're running an uh, assay that's enzymatic, you want to make sure that you're on the linear part of the progress curve, that the V versus E is linear, and that the uh, reagents are not limiting. And if it, you're running a binding assay, you want to make sure the pharmacology behaves normal uh, one-site binding models. If you take care of these systematic errors, then only random errors should remain, and these indeed can be treated systematically. A simplified HTS and HIT triage flow chart is shown on the next slide in the upper, uh, in the leftmost panel. These, of course, start with a primary screen that matches a biological assay specific to a target to a large chemical library, and filtering these activities through this assay, one can then identify initial hits. These hits would then be repeated in the primary assay, then further counter-screened against secondary and counter-screened assays. That would then yield hits, confirmed hits. Additional assays are then used to confirm emergent and nascent structure activity relationships, SAR, and to provide an estimation of the chemical tractability of compound scaffolds that medicinal chemists can evaluate. If these are acceptable, then they would trigger hit to lead and lead optimization activities to generate preclinical lead candidates toward eventual clinical candidate nominations that hopefully will lead to clinical trials and ultimately to a drug at the bottom. Now in the middle, central to all this activity are robust high throughput assays. And in the middle panel, by way of ancient history, you can see a typical 96 volt plate composed of eight rows and 12 columns. Now, typically, the controls are on the edge of the plate and the sample data is arranged to be in the middle of the plate. Um, and typically there are actually more high, com high samples, high signal samples than low signal samples because variances there would be higher. 
In the case of the Molecular Libraries uh, Pro Production Centers, uh, during that time we were provided uh, 96 well plates with 88 compounds uh, in rows columns 2 to 12 with column 1 being empty and all subsequent uh, expansions of that to 384 and 1536 always preserve the leftmost empty wells for controls. But you can see that that's a typical setup. And on the rightmost panel, you can, you can see that at that time, people were looking for ways of uh, assay uh, samples are in the center of the plate, and control wells are often at the edges. Sometimes in, in the case of MLPCN, control wells were in the first two columns, but you can actually define controls well any way you want. A typical setup is to have a higher number of positive controls than negative controls. Um, and so, so at that time in 2006, uh, you know, various assay parameters were being used. And, and then one is uh, to normalize all your data from the maximum to the minimum signal and normalize everything of that signal minus uh, a background. The other way is if you don't have a reference compound, you could also um, do it in terms of the z-score, which is basically in units of standard deviation from the mean, which all of these terms will become more clearer later. And there's various other scores to do that. Um, the reason for all that is to try and treat random errors and um, and, and um, ch check them in statistics of that because random errors actually are normally distributed. So a thing about statistics, you know, um, I think it was Mark Twain was uh, assigned this moniker where he said, you know, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies and statistics. You know, first talk in the morning on a Thursday of statistics is I'm sure a lot of you are still sleepy, so I'm trying to make this a little more exciting. So while well, you can get a really complex statistics and all these mathematical formulas, really what you really need are some simple rules of thumb and simple measures to kind of make sure that you can say the assay is robust and we can really detect hits. So here's some of the terms with regard to statistics. You know, statistics itself is a collection of methods uh, for organizing and you know obtaining, then actually summarizing, looking and interpreting data, so you can draw conclusions. Uh, within statistics, you, you have to really study populations. This is a complete collection of all elements, whether it's uh, high throughput screening data, people, uh, measurements, and stuff, so to be studied. And it's all the individual people in that population. The census is a collection of data from every element in that population, and this. The actual sample is really a sub collection because you in like if you, you can't test all 500 million compound uh, you know all the chemical structures in the world or all the people in the world so you actually take samples so whenever we screen a library we're actually sampling all of chemical space so we're actually having a sample then the parameter is a numerical measurement that describes some characteristic of a population the population we are concerned with is the library of compounds that we have, whether it's 10, 100,000, or, you know, 300,000 compounds. And the statistic is really, again, a numerical measurement describing some characteristic of this sample or compound library. There's two kinds of data, quantitative, which is basic percent inhibition. That's what we actually tend to do. Uh, though, say, in some of our tertiary assays, we can often define qualitative uh, or categorical attributes, basically saying, is it hitting the target or not hitting the target? Not so much the intensity of it, but it's a yes, no characterization. So, you know, this quote was actually assigned to Mark Twain, but actually upon discovery, it was cited even earlier. So statistics is basically, you know, these quality control measurements that you can calculate uh, and it's real good uses is you can use um, you can actually cite that the quality of your agents meet some statistical cutoff so it's uh, over time you can actually say uh, you can give a quantum measurement uh, statistical elements are important being you've seen this all the time for public policy because you use a sampling and you talk about endangered species and basically these numbers after are, have, are impactful because they actually lead to policy in our case we're trying to use statistics to actually find authentic hits 
and uh, you want to make sure, and then some of these hits can go can be the starling white for developing trucks. So these um, concepts have actual meaningful relevance and uh, consequences. So the real key thing is for us as you look at statistics, the ability you have to develop the ability to recognize there's lots of statistics that can be distorted, or the numbers themselves can be represented in a way that gives you a false impression. So you know. Some of the abuse statistics are like if you really have a small sample or there's, you know, it's biased, it's the statistics really kind of lie. So, for instance, if you say seven out of 10 dentists recommend certain toothpaste, but you find out later that everyone was paid for that survey and the company, uh, there's a particular toothpaste company, you know, paying for those surveys, that's, you can see that's distorted, is influenced. The other one is uh, where there's a false sense of accuracy because often, instead of saying something like it's 37,000, you actually go to the penny, you imply that that's a very accurate number because it's really a precise number that implies that it's accurate. So it's a highly precise number, but they could be making it up completely. And the other one is where you took a guesstimate and you actually treat that guesstimate really as a statistic measure, it's not. And the other one is distorted percentages, uh, where people say like it's 100% improvement. What does that mean? You know, is it twofold or is it, you know, a 10,000 fold? So anyway, these are some examples. But the kind that we see a lot of in our world is this kind of thing in eggs, you know, in uh, plots where it looks really significantly different. Um, this is the actual difference in absolute terms, but then if you subtract the background, they can make the window look much bigger. So you really have to pay attention to the numbers, the ranges, okay? And a lot of these concepts are discussed well in this reference here in elementary statistics, it's just a good textbook. So analysis of HDS data, the, as I showed before, uh, to study HDS data, you have to pre-process the data to ensure that it's, uh, to make sure it's statistical meaningfulness is real and the accuracy of the background analysis and hit selection are affected by that. There's procedures for this correction. One is called normalization. This allows you to actually look at plate to plate uh, comparisons. Uh, so you wanna, uh, you wanna, instead of plotting the raw signal, you wanna normalize it to some control. And then you wanna make sure there's a way to correct for non-random or systematic uh, in experimental errors. And so these are these quality control. You wanna look at outliers you want to look at these edge effects I mentioned, and you want to study the drift of uh, controls over time and eliminate instrumental sources, you know, striping. This all lets you then do a selection of hits based on a good normalized data set, and you can analyze the hit distribution relative to a normal distribution. Um, so the key concept is the variability among the replicate controls is going to be used to estimate the variability of the unreplicated compound measures. In other words, control compounds, the same control compound will give you some measure of the error in the instrument and the data collection that then you can use as uh, estimate of variability of the single compounds that you measure only once. The random error can also alternatively be estimated from variably across uh, measurements of all compounds on a plate, assuming that all compounds are generally inactive. And that's a fundamental point of why we can use uh, normal error analysis for height screening data. Okay, that's covered in this reference here. So to make it real, uh, this is your typical 1536 wall assay. Uh, in, in our lab, we tend to, um, you know, use the first four columns uh, for our controls. And again, we use a higher number of high control, high number of high signal uh, replicates versus low signal replicates. And in our case, most of our um, bulk dispensers kind of do the serpentine pattern. So we look to make sure that we don't have like, you know, block tip during the run, which can lead to striping. So the data would show like low signals here all of a sudden. You can often see it in, clog and then go around and then unclog, or it can clog through the whole thing. So, 
um, in our setup, we can run about 1400 plates, uh, compounds per plate. And that these are typical kind of variations where, you know, by looking at color coding and heat maps, you can actually see whether or not the controls actually are, you know, reasonable from high and low. And you can plot the uniformity of raw signal across the plate in a visualization to see that it's, it's relatively flat. And then you can see whether or not their edge effects very quickly. For edge effects are really profound in 1536 wells because the plates themselves have fairly high thermal inertia and um, there's always, there's can be gradients uh, across the plate. And if you have a long lifestyle incubation, uh, it's very hard to keep these uh, wells highly saturated and prevent evaporation from the edges. So that's the thing to look for. Plastic itself is a very poor heat conductor and the cherished challenge of getting enough uh, CO2 and buffering to maintain the pH from uh, the incubators. So that, those are challenges. And practically three to five, three to anything greater than five days is almost impossible doing a 1536 well assay, uh, unless you use very specialized uh, covers that prevent uh, gradient temperatures as well as allow gas exchange. I put together these tables here just to emphasize that, that it, in fact, that while this is your typical volumes for plate formats, the volumes of assays as you go from 96 to 1536. One of the, and then the cost is, uh, the cost scales actually, so that if you look at these costs, it's, you're really paying for about the same per well, whether it's 96 or 1536. So of course, 1536 plates become more expensive. What one other thing, just to realize um, one of the advantages of 1536 is really to reduce the cost of valuable reagents. The plates themselves don't cost that much, truly, but uh, it's if you have a very expensive reagent like your target, which took a lot of time to prepare, that's why you want a 1536 wall plate, because you use less sample. The other, un, the other unappreciated item is that uh, 96 wall plates are thinking like they're like wide um, discs, uh, whereas 1536 plates are more like tall towers. And so the amount of volume contained versus the bottom, the path link is pretty good for 1536, but it's a small area on the bottom. So if you have a acid that looks at uh, attachment to the bottom of the plate, you have less area compared to volume. However, if you have something that depends upon capture of reagent across the uh, all the entire contained volume, the contained volume, the surface area that the contained volume sees the entire inside of the cylinder and the bottom of the well, actually that ratio of con surface area contained and in contact is higher for fifteen thirty six relatively than a ninety six volt plate. So things like uh, Elizas and stuff can be done in 1536 because you actually have enough uh, surface area contacted for volume contained. So some of the ways you can study systematic plate error is um, looking at the to make sure there's smooth trends as you go across an entire run from well number to well number and plate number to plate number is that smooth in terms of uh, data. And then there's no real edge effects. You can see these are kind of randomly distributed. They're flat. If you look plot them by, um, uh, if you plot them by uh, column number, or instead this is just kind of index by row. This is by columns. You can see that again within those parameters, they're scattered, but it's more or less random. And you want to make sure these attenuations are smooth. And other ones, you can see if there's an actual within a plate that there's a systematic rises and increases or drifts up and down, then that's a uh, edge effect there. The other one is um, within a, within the actual run, you can see these day-to-day uh, -day increase in the system. So you, you have to, the striping and these plate edge effects can be visualized in this kind of way. And it's covered well in these um, review articles. There is something called the types of data distribution and something called a central limit theorem. And what that really says is that, you know, given a random error, 
you can have distributions uh, and define parameters. So there's uh, these different kinds of samples. Uh, the normal one is where you have this classic uh, Gaussian shape, but you could also have uh, a distribution where it's, you know, everything's the same uh, value. So it doesn't have to be shaped like this, okay? But uh, you can also have samples which are skewed, which means that um, the centroid is normal, but there's all this additional um, uh, distribution that's a population. It's, it's the value is skewed out and it tails off this way. So this is the frequency versus the value. The, if you have a normal distribution, as you increase the number of, if you, this is the actual distribution, if you take sample means, that means you take groups of five or groups of 10, as you do that, the sample means uh, tighten up the distribution, but they still maintain their Gaussian shape. What's interesting, if you do the same procedure, if we're taking sample means of even a uniform distribution or skewed, to skewed distribution, as you take means of, of each of groups and take that means and plot the average of the means, they tend to become Gaussian. And this is called the central limit theorem. What the practical rule really is, you know, for sample sizes, you want to have a sample greater than about 30 to ensure that you have random sampling of any distribution so that the random sampling is normally distributed. That's that's what this means. So the way you can think of a central limit here, here's an actual example of central limit. You know, it's a sample size increases the sampling distribution of sample means approaches normal distribution. So here here's the uh, distribution of just 200 digits, you know. So if you have 200 digits, it's going to either be one, two, three, or four. So it's going to be pretty uniform, right? For any random number. But if you take this 200 digits and group them by samples, um, uh, where, and of four, you keep plotting, you know, 50 samples, and you you take 50 of the 200, and you calculate that, and you count the average. Since it's since the after 10 digits are randomly distributed, you would imagine the most frequent one is right in the middle, and that's what happen. So if you take of the 200 digits, you take 50 groups of 50 and groups of 50 randomly and plot those means, the means will approach the midpoint. So that's this, again, an illustration central theorem. All of this is belabored because pop creating sample means allows you to ensure that uh, if you do that and you have um, distributed, normal distributed means, you can be sure that's a normal population. So what is the average of the central tendency? Uh, it's its average we always calculate for um, for data we look at. You can think of it as basically the mean, the balance point of a distribution. So it's where the high and low values all distribute such that it balances. So think of it as the fulcrum. And the way you calculate means are you know arithmetic means and medians, modes, and mid range. So these are standard things that you done in the lab. Its uses are, um, these are the actual definitions. The, some of the things about it is, you know, some of these are affected by extreme artifacts. So means tend to be, medians, of course, you just look at the central stuff that it really, what medians do when, uh, is that the median is the middle value, so it's insensitive to extreme values. You can always calculate it. This is the one that's most familiar to us. The mode is where um, a value is the most frequently expressed, and we don't always use that. It's sometimes used, but um, there, you know, there may be more than one mode depending upon uh, the randoms, uh, the number of data. So, for instance, for this here, you can calculate. You can do this on your own once you look at the slide. You can calculate the mean, the median, the mode for these distributions. So, the next concept is standard deviation. Uh, um, standard deviation measures the variance among scores. So basically, the spread in the data. You can see that this one has no standard deviation. Uh, it's you've measured the frequency seven times exactly the same number, so it's zero standard deviation, which is generally not what you get. 
Um, as the standard deviation gets larger, you can see, of course, the spread gets bigger. And so standard deviation is measure of spread, and it's intuitively what we do. The, comp the format of stuff is quite complex for a sample. And when you do a population, that means the sample becomes very large. So you, instead of having this one degree of loss of freedom here, with a small number is n, you just use the total number of samples. And uh, instead of the average calculator, you calculate the actual statistical mean. So, again, standard deviation is just a measure of spread. Now, for normally distributed data, which is um, what we always tend to work with, is there is something called the 68, 95, 90% rule. So, basically, in units of standard deviation, if one unit, most of the area on the curve, you know, is in one unit of standard deviation. If you go out three standard deviations, 99. You know, seven percent of all the values fall within three three standard deviations. So it's the major part of this. It's one here, two here, and three. So you get most of the area under this curve. We generally tend to take that cutoff. Okay. So why is why why can we look at high throughput screening data and use this normally uh, normal distribution analysis? Basically, you can do that because most of random compounds are inactive against the target at that screening concentration. Put another way, if you screen at 10 micromolar, right, um, that's like having, uh, um, for, for a compound to show up as a hit at 10 micromolar, you're saying it's within, uh, it is greater than 50% inhibition at that IC50. Mm -hmm. So the other way to think about it is, um, if I if if I ask you uh, to run a screen and I give you a compound that has an IC50 of 10 micromolar, if I screen it at 10 micromolar, now this is the same compound. It's not an actual library. It's just 300,000 replicates of the same identical compound. If you were to test it, you would basically uh, have the mean percent inhibition right at 50% because it's IC50 is 10 micromolar. So all that data will distribute normally, right? But if you test at a lower concentration, if you test at one micromolar, then you're going to be at instead of 50% activity, you're going to be 10% activity. If you're going to 10 IC50 with 100 micromolar, you're at 90%. You can see this illustrates that no matter the concentration, no matter the assay, as long as it's a pure compound, it will be normally distributed to reflect the value of the IC50. The reason why we can um, look at high throughput screening data and just take the um, Gaussian distribution is because at 10 micromolar, most compounds actually have IC50s that are even uh, higher. Um, so they're inactive at 10 micromolar. So they behave like noise is what it is. So they're more like acting like um, a 10 micromolar. It's like you're screening at at a lower concentration uh, where it's not hitting its IC50. So you can see that this is the central tendency of high throughput screening data will be mostly noise. Uh, and then this figure here shows that you have to be careful because if you had a, if you increase the concentration of uh, compounds tested, what you do is uh, you can slightly shift the mean to higher values. Um, but you actually tend to then spread out the data. And a good actual assay, you're looking for a central tendency of noise with this skew of compounds. And having this skew is what tells you that the screen is finding useful hits. You can see if you arbitrarily increase the concentration, let's say in this theoretical model, you increase it higher, you're going to actually move the central tendency higher, and the skew will still be there. But now you've compressed the skew and your statistics will actually cut off hits and you'll lose some of the weaker hits. So it's more important to have a lower concentration where you have a lot of skew. And that's the best way to get it. So the good screen actually gives you the best, best skew. And if the AUC under, uh, area under the curve uh, is predicted from Gaussian, you're really trying to look at the residual compounds that have outside of that uh, mean. Okay. So that's an important point because often during screening, you'll, you'll be told to screen at a much higher concentration, which can lead to other problems. But 
the ideal screen is screening at the lower concentration where you have the most pronounced skew. So assay robustness implies, you know, that you can get day-to-day -day and lab-to-lab -lab, uh, consistency. The results are not affected by minor perturbations and uh, that you've developed and optimized and validated all the assays to establish all the assay performance metrics. So the assay should be valid in these two, two stages. The stage one is the dynamic range and signal response. And stage two is to make sure the, uh, there's reproducing the right parameters. So this is, um, when I came on the screening scene, there was a question of, you know, we have all these very complex formulas of, is there just a simple parameter that we can use to summarize an assay robustness? And we came upon, um, when I first started screening, I was told to just get the biggest window possible. So, you know, if you have a, a big number in terms of uh, the high value and the low value. So here, in this case, the signal to background the window is 10. Here, the signal to background the window is smaller. So, you know, I was told that's, the, that's all you need to go to. But if you look at this top, you can see that this assay, even though it has a five-fold signal to background in terms of the means of the high and low signal, there's a distribution, and this distribution here versus distribution of the low signal, you can see there's a zone of clearance. So that seemed to be an assay that, while noisy and having a low signal background, looked pretty good. Whereas here, there's a high signal to background of tenfold, but you can see the scatter in the top high signal is such that um, these these uh, averages kind of overlap. So these common no notions of you know, high signal over background as, as being enough is actually um, not a good measure. And it turns out that you have to look at the distribution. So it's a little complex and not statistical. So to actually try to measure something, you know, that's a simple parameter. And the parameter is the Z, the Z factor, which we define. And this is what the Z factor is. Um, what it reflects is high signal of your samples uh, and low signals of your controls. Each of those signals should be randomly distributed and they will have their distribution and there's a measure of their standard deviation. And 95% of, you know, 97% of all the area here is represented within your standard deviation. So you really ask if the signal of your low signal and signal of your high signal, whether they actually uh, are well separated. So whether there is a separation band, which you could see here. So there's this clear zone here. Um, so you can calculate this ratio based upon the relative standard deviations of your high and low signal, and you count that by with this parameter here. And if you have a good zone of separation, you're going to have a good number. So this is the formula we came up with. And the way you think about this is you look at limits. If you have uh, an assay where there's no noise, so one of these becomes very low, it you know approaches zero, or you know each of the individual zeros, then this term sigma s plus sigma uh, controls and samples that becomes zero. So it's zero over some number, and that becomes one, right? So z prime of one means that you have no noise, and there's a there's a separation band. The other way you can do at a Z prime of one is even if you have some noise that the distance between the means from the sample and the control, that difference approaches affinity. So those are just so well separated that despite the noise, the top bottom term is inf infinite. And so that sample over infinity, this becomes zero and Z prime again goes to one. So that's what this limits of term means. Uh, so practically what happens is as long as Z prime is between 0.5 and 1, it's a good assay. If it's um, 0, you have a marginal assay. Uh, if, if you have 0 to 5, it's, it's a marginal assay, so it's below specs. When it's 0, what it really means is uh, um, these distributions meet and there's no separation band, so the actual bands meet, there's no separation band, so it's a coin toss, is there yes or no? And if it's less than zero, it means that the um, 
separation band is completely gone and the variations overlap each other. So you really can't know which is um, a good error, uh, which is a good number. So just the anecdote is, you know, I, I thought this formula was so simple. It was almost intuitively obvious. And um, when my group came to me and showed me the value of this, I thought, well, that's kind of trivial. Uh, you could just kind of put a note in and not publish it. So, uh, but my, uh, my uh, director, the guy that worked with me actually uh, advocated for it and now it's become one of the most cited papers. So it's uh, often important to realize what becomes a standard. Okay, so this the reference for that, I'm sorry to belabor that, but again, the simple rule of, the reason why I think it's used is it's easy to remember these simple rules of thumb. A Z prime of beta between 0.5 and 1 is your parameter that says the assay is robust. And this is how it's practically used for actual screen. You can plot all the data from your actual assay. You can plot the actual controls, uh, and then you can actually plot the, the actual screen itself. So, so for the controls, that itself is a Z prime, and it's good to have then a reference compound. So you can see here's the three standard deviations, great separation band. When you plot the data scatter plot, you can actually see the same separation band over all the data. So this is why, um, it's a simple measure. Again, an actual primary screen you know, for a 300,000 compound library for an alpha ELISA where there's a um, target. And uh, you can see here what we did was we screened a small sample set, calculated the totals, uh, background and the totals, and the, looked at the signal to background ratio and calculated the Z factor. And we got a pretty big number of hits. Uh, then we actually screened the full library and uh, we, we got comparable statistics, uh, comparable Z prime, signal background was good. And the hit rate was, you know, uh, higher, but reasonable. So this is how you actually propagate between a pilot screen and a full screen. And this is real data again. So um, it's good to actually plot the pilot and the full data and you can see they generally behave the same and you can have a good window here. And, and other visualizations are scatter plots. And these scatter plots uh, are important because they emphasize the deflection, whereas the frequency distributions emphasize the normal distribution. Uh, you can see the controls are strictly normal, whereas the actual assay, you can see it's normal and then you can see this tail here, the skew. So this is a really perfect assay. The final thing is, uh, you know, to get rid of these um, systematic errors like here, we actually use gene data to actually look at the stacked view of all uh, 260 plates in the screen. And we saw that there was a systematic um, deflection and we were able to then correct it and flatten the assay. So what it does is if you distribute, if you do this correction across the board in an unbiased fashion, you can tighten up the distribution and make it more Gaussian. Uh, but the reason to do that is to weed out false positives uh, and get real true hits. So that's how we use that. The other assay performance parameter that anyone who runs screens is as you run plates through the assay, you want to actually calculate the Z factor and positive controls and, and, and all these parameters like signal to background, signal to noise, um, and the minimum maximum values. But Typical one we look at is to make sure the Z factor maintains itself through the run on a plate by plate basis. The final note on um, screening is, you know, when you get, when you screen and you get to a hit threshold, uh, many times you, you can do a fixed cutoff or you can actually uh, say that greater than standard, three standard deviation from the mean of the centroid is how you're gonna set your cutoff because then everything beyond that it's outside uh, the central tendency uh, and normal distribution, so that would be a real hit. But an important point is, um, so if you pick a threshold, there's units of standard deviation from that threshold. You should expect hits out here to replicate at a higher uh, frequency. But you have to realize that if you're at the threshold, Theoretically, you can never get better than 50% confirmation at the threshold because the compound then is either active or inactive 
half the time, right? It's right at threshold. Whereas if you're here, it's going to be active more of the time. And it still follows the same basic 68, you know, uh, 88, 95% rule. So that's how you do it. So practically hit confirmation. What it means is if you run a screen and your assay is robust, you should expect hit confirmation between 35 and 40%. Uh, you can't ever get better than 50. You, you can get better than 50% if all your hits are really far away. But since the hits themselves are distributed over a skew, this central tendency will be somewhere in the middle here. So um, the main thing is if you have a bad assay, your hit rates confirmations will be less than 25%. And that's often um, if you are got systematic noise, you still didn't correct for even though you thought you did. The other um, concept is, you know, screening, you get these assay parameters figured out because you want to make sure that you don't miss uh, hits. Uh, and um, you can study this, this uh, <coughs> visualization. But what you really want to do is um, you want to eliminate false negatives, not false positive. False positive means you score something as hit that's not, and that reduces your efficiency. A false negative is you miss the actual hit that you uh, wanted to find, so that type 2 error. This missed hit is actually the one that actually gives you the, keeps us awake at night because you could miss the compound that could later on set the stage to become a uh, drug. The way you can actually improve and reduce the level of false negatives and false positives is to run replicates. And that's why when you know we screen uh, we we test the hits uh, in replicate to reduce that number. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I pointed out that while you can run a high throughput screen, the uh, primary assay, you know, could be um, let's see when you run a primary screen, it 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 just can be throws a high number of false positives and things, you know, and it's hard to identify complex pharmacology such as partials, you know, agonism or antagonism simply with a single concentration. So whenever we follow up hits, we want to do a dose response um, in high throughput. And that re basically requires you to have methods to rapid curve fitting and classification um, because it's really hard to look at a lot of uh, dose response curves by eye. In, in our group, we tend to actually set our dose response curves uh, in triplicate down a column. So this gives you like 10 point dose response. You can do 15 point in duplicate, but we set them up vertically. Uh, that way that if there is a striping error, you might lose a data point, but you don't lose the entire curve. Because if you actually set them up along this way, uh, you could actually get striping. So the point on this is you can show that, you know, one plate, you can run about 50, 43 compounds in 10 point uh, duplicate, in 10 point dilutions and triplicates. So, so that's a good turnaround, or you can actually run 129 compounds per plate. So this uh, 96, uh, one, 1536 fold plate really makes it easy to keep in touch with uh, chemists doing their SAR cycle. So you can run, you know, plates once a week uh, and have basically a one week turnaround for the whole test. So that helps that. NCAS did a great job in actually uh, having methods to classify um, hit to lead uh, dose response curves as ones that give you a complete curve. Um, that's called the class one. Uh, you can have a complete and partial response, and then you can have incomplete curves where they kind of plateau, you don't have a full thing, and that's called the class two. You have ones that basically just sim gives the most no activity and a little bit of bump, and that's really reduces back to a simple activity. But ones that are just completely flat, and that's a class four. So NCATS has a method to automatically populate this, so you can look at thousands of those response curves along. Okay. So the final comments is that you know HTS relies on statistically based rules of thumb to inform on assays. And remember, uh, you want to not have a perfect, but a good enough assay, and that single points uh, is not as accurate as having replicates. We assume much about the data distribution. 
And remember the purpose of the screen is to ID hits and starting points. So the most important thing is if you uh, actually can risk uh, mitigate the risk of these uh, false positive and false negatives using uh, proper statistics, um, you can say that you've actually screened pretty well, okay? The important thing is, it's just as important to say that your screen was run statistically correctly um, so that you can say that, that that library didn't have good hits for my target. So I should need to find a different library rather than just saying screen at a higher concentration. That's like saying that the, you know, the fish is not in that pond, I have to fish in a different pond. So, so that's it. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, TC. Um, there is one question. Well, uh, if you don't mind, we can answer that quickly and move on to the next talk. Sure. Um, so uh, the question is, what is the best compound screening concentration so that you maximize Q and still see activity of weak compounds? Yes. So again, um, practically, the the biggest thing that limits uh, concentration is the salt solubility of libraries. So uh, practically, we never screen higher than about 20 to uh, 30 micromolar. Um, you can you can actually get that. Uh, you can actually find that out through your screening of if you look at your uh, same library that you screen at several targets, you can actually see if there's more uh, noise, uh, whether the acid is robust, um, you can also pre-screen your entire library for solubility by using, um, you know, um, scattering measurements. Uh, but we find generally random libraries uh, really don't, aren't meant to be screened at more like 20 or 30 micromolar. And uh, what, what I would do is actually, I, what I would actually do is do the analysis and look at the distribution and plot the skew. And then it's good to have a couple of reference compounds. Oh, okay, thank you very much, uh, TC, for this wonderful presentation.